Awesome. So thank you everyone for joining our Fossil Finds series. I want to thank Dr. Wagner for joining us today um, for our second topic, our second series here. Um, I, my name is Jessica and I serve as one of the uh, council members on the MSK Found, uh, Fossil Council. I'm going to give just a brief introduction for Dr. Wagner and then I will take myself off screen and I'm going to give it all over to you. So Dr. Wagner serves as one of our esteemed orthopedic surgeons here at Emory. He was born in San Francisco, California, but has lived in multiple cities prior to college. He completed his undergraduate education at University of California, Davis, where he lettered for three years in basketball and majored in biochemistry and molecular biology. He then completed medical school at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Following medical school, he completed his orthopedic surgery residency training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, which is ranked number two by the US News and World Report. After residency, Dr. Wagner was selected to train in the top-ranked hand and microvascular surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Following this year, Dr. Wagner was selected to train in the prestigious Harvard's International Soldier and Elbow Fellowship at Massachusetts General and Brigham and w w Women's Hospitals in Boston, Massachusetts. As part of the international component of the Harvard Fellowship, Dr. Wagner trained with world leaders in soldier, sol, soldier, so, ugh, sorry, I can't uh, talk today, sol, uh, shoulder uh, arthroplasty and arthroscopy in France. That uh, must have been a great experience. In his free time, Dr. Wagner enjoys fly fishing, tango and swing dancing, which I thought was really cool, skiing, playing and watching basketball, traveling and reading. So it sounds like you are a very active individual and I completely love that. Um, so thank you again for joining us everyone. And we hope that you enjoyed tonight's uh, Fossil Find series. Wonderful, thank you very much for that uh, awesome introduction. Um, and uh, I don't, my tango skills are not at uh, Jim Roberson's, but, um, but yes, we do. I do find the dancing really fun. Um, awesome. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I um, am uh, privileged and honored to sort of be a part of this incredible organization, this incredible effort that you and, and, uh, and Ani and, and, um, and Ed Jackson have uh, kind of pioneered and, um, you know, I'm humbled to follow Mara Shanker and, and her incredible sort of talk last time. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take it on a little bit of a deviation from where Mara left off and talking about some of her work and the social disparities and, and, and its impact on, on sort of clinical outcomes. Um, we're going to sort of talk about some of the stuff that um, sort of I've grown passionate about and uh, my research team has really started to kind of focus in on um, both not just what we're doing, but what kind of the world is doing around this stuff and kind of some of the cool things that hopefully um, you can see that have some future potential. Um, you'll have to excuse me, my bias is I'm, I'm very a research minded person who, who likes evidence, who likes um, facts and that type of stuff. So you'll see my bias in, in presenting a lot of the kind of evidence and research and stuff that like is concrete and that you can maybe matter up your mind around. One of my goals for this though, is for you not to sit here and, and just kind of like rehash all the stuff that I'm going, but, but sort of sit back, relax and, and kind of open your mind and think about what some of the stuff that I'm gonna to present to you, some of the, the, some of the stories, some of the evidence, um, what that kind of means to you and, and what, um, what you think either you or what you think we as a, as a, as a division in upper extremity or we as a group in Emory can do about some of this stuff and kind of take it back for your own perspective. Try not to just let me tell you, because I'm not really, my goal is not to tell you stuff. My goal is to present stuff that I've read. I have my own opinions, but I'm not really here to give you my opinions as much. I'm really here to kind of just give the data, give the evidence and, and let you make your own, own, own decisions. So, so without further ado, um, I'm going to talk about disparities in healthcare utilization and how it really is involving issues with trust, access, and equality, and how this is all impacting you know, our nation's health, our, our orthopedic practices, and our orthopedic colleagues. And this all stems back from this sort of landmark study back in 1993. So in the New England Journal of Medicine, they came out with this kind of novel, um, um, kind of rippling study that caught a lot of press 
on how at the Veterans Affairs Administration, the VA hospital, a uniform insurance that black patients were somewhere between um, 38 and 122% less likely to undergo invasive cardiac procedures like cabbages and carotid carotid interactive. Um, and, and this had nothing to do with insurance, had nothing to do with access. It had to do with this, uh, this sort of less likeliness to undergo these procedures. And um, it really kind of started this conversation and, and, and started a lot of, of talk, a lot of conversation, a lot of efforts about um, to understand why this is the case and, and what, what, are, what, what sort of can happen over time. And, and the question you have is, is, as that conversation happened, as it got a lot of media attention and, and a lot of attention around the American Medical Association and a variety of other areas, you know, interesting enough, as the kind of decades went, it didn't really change a whole lot. So this article comes out, it gets a lot of attention, but yet, um, as you can see in this really nice study, 158 hospital regions around the country, from when that article was published for a decade later, um, the, the disparities didn't really change. The, you still had these significant disparities in um, when you compare the number of, 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 and this is per 100 really, really. So this is not just overall, but this is per like standardized score. There are different races per, per 100 really so white men. You had a much higher percentage that were undergoing these carotid endarterectomies than, than black men or black women. Um, same thing with cabbage. Uh, same thing with total hip replacement. So kind of hitting home here in orthopedics. So you have these disparities in healthcare utilization. Um, and, and in this, this was a VA study. This was a study looking at various regions throughout the country. But once again, um, really kind of started to hit home that there was this disparity. And this, this, there was a disparity not only in, um, in, in, in utilization, but it seemed to um, cross specialties. It seemed to go beyond um, cardiac and, and hit most of the sur surgical specialties. Um, you know, and, and this sort of really kind of hit, hits home. It, they looked at the different regions and which regions had a growing disparity and which regions had a smaller disparity, meaning that which regions over that 10 year gap did, did that disparity close and which regions did it, did it grow much larger? And, 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 and I'll talk about that later, but this, this, um, this column here shows, I mean, the vast majority of the region, the disparity grew larger in every, every, all these procedures. Um, and sort of other studies have kind of further um, reinforced what, what this study. So this is looking at even a little bit later. So 1999 through 2006, um, you know, when looking at uh, instead of surgery, but control of, of different heart, heart and, and diabetes parameters, and, and finding that when you standardize for socioeconomic status, when you standardize for insurance status and a variety of other um, factors in a, in a multivariate model, including 10 different variables, um, there is still a significant difference in blood pressure control between white patients and black patients and white patients and Hispanic patients. Um, there was a, also a big difference in, in HbO and C levels between white patients and black patients and white patients and Hispanic patients. Um, and, and this could not be explained by disease status, comorbidities, um, social economic status, insurance status. So this was um, really about a, a racial difference, a social factor that was causing differences in actual health, both health utilization and um, ultimately you can see health, health outcomes. And this is when the Institute of Medicine started getting involved. Um, this is, you know, around 2006 or 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, that's when a lot of these national agencies started um, paying attention. So the Institute of Medicine or the National Academy of Medicine published this um, uh, great book on unequal treatment and confronting some of these racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Um, and this kind of started the efforts of some of the research that you're going to see me talk about afterwards. And this is where the world sort of, at least the United States, but even around Europe, um, really started paying attention that there's these, these true disparities. They could not be explained away by differences in insurances or differences in social economics. Um, and there was a lot more complexity underlying these, these, these disparities. Um, and this is also when or the field of orthopedics started to take notice. Um, you know, that one study that published in the New England Journal talked about the disparities in, in total hip arthroplasty. And, and, you know, given orthopedics and given you know, 50% of, of, of emergency department visits are uh, musculoskeletal cares. And 
Um, one of the most common procedures performed is a hip or a knee replacement. And, you know, the impact of the growing field of, of arth shoulder arthroscopy or knee arthroscopy and fractures. I mean, so many people are impacted by, by musculoskeletal care and orthopedic care. So the, the, the fact that, you know, orthopedics like starts paying attention and gets involved, this is, is critical. This is a, something that, um, you know, as a field that we uh, sort of have a responsibility to look more into. And, and, and we, we have, to some, to some extent, started to do this, particularly as usual, our hip and knee colleagues are sort of leading the way. They often are leading the way in a lot of issues around um, research and do a fabulous job in, 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 in sort of um, pioneering some of these, novel, these first steps. And so, um, you know, Jay Singh, uh, um, uh, somebody who I've collaborated with in the past, did a, did a study looking at racial disparities in hip and knee arthroplasty. Um, once again, uh, was shown in this JBS kind of very landmark study in 2020, both showing that these disparities were present in total hip and total knee arthroplasty. Um, this kind of shows you a little bit more, but like when you look at um, uh, this disparity from 1991 to 2008, the not only did the um, disparity per 100 Medicare beneficiaries stay the same, but it actually increased, and in, and um, uh, particularly with regards to primary total knee arthroplasty, um, primary total hip, while it didn't necessarily increase, it definitely did improve. And so, you know, over these decades of change, including in 2002, 2003, when a lot of the institutes were really pushing a lot of efforts to address these disparities. Um, at least in our peaks, things really were not changing a whole lot. And we still saw these significant um, disparities. Revision also had it um, to less extent in revision um, total knee arthroplasty, but revision total hip arthroplasty, you can see there's once again, a kind of growing disparity and, and, and regardless, it's not improving. And so there's, there's something that's causing less black patients to undergo these procedures then, then why patients, when you standardize by a, a, a multivariate model looking at um, everything from comorbidities to social economic status to, to insurance status. And um, even more relevant in, in even more recent years, you can see this disparity has also kind of persisted through from 2005 to 2015. So you, once again, it's not necessarily increasing in gap, but it's definitely not getting better. Um, and this is a spite efforts nationally um, that are that are that are trying to address this this idea of disparity and and it's not just the fact that there's a disparity but with this disparity also comes and, and and lack of or lack of uniform utilization there has been many of these studies an impact on on outcomes so you know the Singh study showed that um, mortality rates were, were higher for black patients than 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 white patients now it did close a little bit in primary total hip but nonetheless, this is um, uh, this this persisted revision total hip and, and total knee. The mortality rates were different, and you know these are very low rates. But nonetheless, you're almost talking about a double mortality rate. Like the say was 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 longer for for black patients. Discharge to um, skilled nursing facilities complications. Um, you know you 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 go through it, and black patients sort of not only were having um, issues with utilization, but the outcomes were not the same. Um, and once again, this isn't a multivariate model. So this is not just a, a isolated finding. This is when you control for a variety of other factors, this still remains significant and remains important. And this is what's piqued our interest. And you know, many of you know me, but um, sorry, I'm an upper extremity surgeon specialized in kind of shoulder to type, fingertip type of practice. And you know, shoulder arthroplasty in particular has just has been increasing faster than almost any other procedure in orthopedics. So if you look at over the last um, decade and the projected over the next, um, you know, five to 10 years, total hip, total knee arthroplasty is increasing as usual. It's kind of this steady increase that you've seen, but it's not like total shoulder. Total shoulder, while it's less than total hip or total knee, it, the ex, it's exponentially increasing at a much faster rate than either total hip and total knees. They're projected to continue to exponentially increase. And this exponential increase is really because of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. The success we've had with the reverse has been like sort of instrumental since it was improved in the United States in 2004, and it's just taken off in its indications our ability to treat patients. But this is also why I find it interesting to study this question surrounding total arthroplasty because it's increasing so much and because it's becoming such a, it's, it's new technology, it's new procedure, but at the same time, it's, it's increasing at such a fast pace and such an exponential rate, faster than uh, almost any procedure we've seen in a long time. So, 
there have been some preliminary studies finding that there are disparities in, in utilization of, of shoulder arthroplasty. So, you know, uh, three and a half percent uh, of all patients undergoing shoulder arthroplasty in 2005, um, only 3.4% were, 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 were black patients. Um, in, in, uh, in 2011, it was 4.5% of, of patients. Um, other studies are kind of studied to a lesser extent that there are these disparities. Um, it hasn't been studied, definitely the study has not been to the same extent as hip knee arthroplasty. Um, this, uh, this sort of great article that uh, looked at um, all these demographic factors, all these social factors, including where they live, and found that the, the most important factors when evaluating a treatment of a rotator cuff tear, whether you're doing shoulder arthroplasty, whether you're doing a repair, was that black female patients with Medicaid insurance were less likely or more likely to be treated non-operatively than non-Medicaid white male patients. So let me, let me say this again. So if you, you, you're, you're a black female patient that had Medicaid insurance, um, you're, you're less likely to undergo surgery than a non-Medicaid white male patient. So this has nothing to do with their type of rotator cuff tear. It has nothing to do with their pathology has nothing to do with their age, has nothing to do with their activity level. All of these real considerations that, that we do consider when evaluating how to actually treat a rotator cuff tear, the most important factors had nothing to do with the actual tear itself. The most, the most important factors were, were these, you know, race, gender, and insurance status factors. Um, and and the, a lot of these were based off of data that was, you know, a decade or plus old. Um, but we have sort of found that this is persisting still to today. And this is one of the first kind of starts to our, our research project in this and how we're investigating this. So we, Kevin Parley, Jake Wilson, um, Alex Gashak and I um, all sort of decided to look into the idea of, of how is the racial disparities um, and other factors contributing to uh, utilization of shoulder wash capacity. How is it changing? Is, is, is there any differences from, when, from previous decades? Um, you know, there's a lack of data, like unlike hip and the earth capacity on, on are, these, are, these, are these still present? And if they are present, what's contributing to them? And so we did this study and found from when you like 2011 to 2017, um, there's, there's, there was a disparity and unlike hip and knee arthroplasty, you actually look, the disparities get worse. So when you look at white patients compared to black patients compared to Hispanic, and this is um, age and sex standardized rates of shoulder arthroplasty by race, meaning that in all equal, um, you know, per 100,000 white patients, this is how many undergo, per 100,000 black patients, this is how many undergo these, these procedures. So when you standardize by, by, by everything else, there, there was a disparity in 2011, and this disparity got larger in 2017. In 2017, we had a 152% disparity, 151% disparity, meaning that there was, uh, the white patients were 152, 151% more likely to, to undergo this shoulder arthroplasty than, than the black or Hispanic patients. When you compare this to hip and knee arthroplasty, it is present there, but it is not the same. There was a bigger disparity and growing disparity in shoulder arthroplasty than there is in hip and knee arthroplasty. Is this because shoulder arthroplasty is a newer procedure? Is this because of um, the maybe uh, availability of providers that do shoulder arthroplasty compared to hip and knee? Um, is this, why is there a growing disparity? And, 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 and why, um, although hip and knee aren't exactly decreasing the disparity, why is shoulder arthroplasty getting worse? Um, when you're looking at anatomic versus reverse shoulder arthroplasty, um, you can see that the um, disparity with the, <coughs> excuse me, with the reverse was um, sort of growing over time, um, potentially because of the new technology, potentially because it hasn't been around as long. Not entirely sure that, well, why, what could explain this, but nonetheless, to, to, to objectively present this, I mean, there is a bigger disparity in, in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, not to say that there isn't a disparity in, 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 in change in disparity in, in, uh, in uh, elective anatomic shoulder arthroplasty, but 
when you sort of further break it down by age, there wasn't really a difference between the different group age groups. Gender, you know, interesting enough, of the, of the people that undergo this, you can see African-American males or black males are much less likely than the black females. Um, and when you look at the ratio, it's, 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 it's more uh, with white patients and Hispanic patients, you know, it, it does seem like African-American males or black males are, are um, you know, where a lot of this disparity is present to a lesser extent in Hispanic males as well. But um, there, there does appear to be a, uh, a, a very real, real disparity in that specific group. Um, without question, you know, insurance status does play a role. And, and there is, uh, there in, at least in this, in this study, looking at the kind of across the country, there are heart, more people, more African-Americans, more, um, more Hispanics that, that, do, uh, that do have Medicaid versus white patients. Um, nonetheless, when we control for that as a factor, it, it did not sort of pan out. Um, and just like other studies, so yes, the disparity, but does that matter? Yeah, I mean, it does. And, and the reason why it does is there are differences in, in, in costs. There's differences in non-home discharge, length of stay, complications. There are differences that when you account for all these other factors still persist when you're looking at purely, you know, the, a white patient versus a black patient versus a Hispanic patient. Um, and this is the multivariate model looking at this, that, that when you standardize all these variables, there still are differences in, in these um, utilization outcomes and these uh, rates of non home discharge and, 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 and the complications that we have examined. And, and so kind of as I, <coughs> um, kind of as, as we talk about this um, and as you think about some of that data and as you think about, you know, the idea of this this disparity in utilization rates, um, and um, this this kind of mounting amount of evidence that make it not only not undeniable, meaning you can't really argue against this very objective data, but then you ask why is this present? And and there's a lot of different explanations. Um, there's some really interesting reads I can refer you to over um, if, if those of you that are interested. But some really nice, really thoughtful articles on some of the leaders in these fields. Um, these these four gentlemen are are working. Alex Daz, Roy Taz, <coughs> John Hurton, <coughs> and Lawrence. Um, these are my um, sort of partners in this effort to um, to help to answer this question about why these yield utilization disparities exist and potentially what can we do about them. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this questionnaire that we've implemented, but. <coughs> When you think about it, there's a lot of potential explanations. You know, is this an insurance problem? Is it socioeconomic status? Is it a patient preference? Is it an access issue? Is it a physician <coughs> um, bias? Um, you know, either uh, a physician uh, um, conscious or unconscious bias. You know, risk reward. Like, what what is causing this? I'm going to go through some possible explanations, a little bit of evidence that might support it. Um, but I really want you to kind of form your own opinions on what you think and, and, and why you think these, these might exist. You know, from a insurance standpoint, we did a study looking at um, Medicaid as, a, as an independent factor in, in shoulder arthroplasty, showing that Medicaid patients had higher rates of complications, reoperation, like I said, resource utilization in shoulder arthroplasty. Um, that just insurance status alone predicted a lot of these sort of negative negative outcomes and and lower utilization rates. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the hip arthroplasty, um, our colleagues uh, George Gallaud and and David Sean and a couple others, um, Tom Bradbury, have all looked at how um, Medicaid patients had higher readmissions, reoperations, length of stay. So very similar to to what I showed you in the uh, shoulder arthroplasty. That this um, uh, the, these insurance status alone was a predictor for, for worse outcomes and and um, worse uh, worse uh, resource utilization rates. Um, other ones have shown that if you standardize by insurance status, so Ron Navarro, who's one of the leads in Kaiser, with the universal insurance, showing that you actually improve some outcomes if you can standardize it via insurance. However, not all the outcomes was the same that purely standardizing insurance, so having Kaiser insurance where everybody has equal access, it didn't necessarily change everything. There still was lower overall utilization rates of hip and knee arthroplasty in black and Hispanic patients. There also was higher rates of, of emergency right brain presentation after, after uh, total hip arthroplasties. Um, 
So insurance test doesn't seem to be the sole responsible factor for some of these, these rates. Um, there's been others that looked at. So once again, Ron Navarro, our, one of my partners in the, in our shoulder study, um, who, who showed once again, insurance status, a universal insurance did improve outcomes, disparities between races, but didn't solve all of them. There still was a lower utilization rate with, with black patients. And um, there once again was still a higher rates of, of readmissions and emergency department presentations after surgery. So maybe it's a geographic thing, and maybe there's a geographic difference that uh, that um, could explain some of these utilization differences. So you know that that one of that sort of novel studies or or landmark studies that I quoted to you in in the New England Journal of Medicine. So once again, vast majority of patients or the vast majority of these disparities between 1992 and 2001, most of the regions they looked at the gap widened instead of narrowing. So much fewer of the regions did the gap narrow, meaning that the disparity gap continued to get more. Um, there's another studies that look at and showing some of these geographic disparities or geographic variances and disparities. Um, you can see this map of rotator cuff utilization rates and, and showing the dark red of where you have much higher utilization and much higher recommendations for surgery and, and, the, and the, the lighter is, is much lower. And maybe this isn't a attributed to, to um, practice patterns, availability of surgeons, but maybe there's not. Maybe there's some uh, region differences. Maybe there's some cultural differences. Maybe there's some unconscious bias. There, it doesn't make sense why there would be regional differences in how you treat a pathology, um, um, especially so diverse as this. So what about social factors? Well, you know, socioeconomic status is often something that's talked about. People with lower socioeconomic status, like in this study, uh, there's that, that looked at. Um, uh, a randomized uh, or a blinded cohort of, of patients um, and, and looked at, uh, you kind of graded a patient's engagement in pediatrician visits and showing that um, there was people with lower socioeconomic status had less engagement during the pediatrician visits and then than sort of their, their other counterparts. Um, there's suggestions maybe reduced social support. So um, really nice kind of, um, uh, really nicely driven by the, the Department of Home of, of Human Resources. We looked at this study looking at um, how, uh, how different factors were impacted by, by outcomes um, for a variety of different procedures and found that you know, Black patients in general reported a lower rate of home support and more likely to be discharged to a uh, home without, without somebody at home to help. White patients had higher rates of anxiety and depression that they reported and, and really contributed to their anxiety about sort of surgery. Hispanic and Asian patients uh, um, uh, independently had worse improvements in, the, in ADLs after these surgeries. Once again, these were after this is a large, you know, thousand plus patient study um, looking at multiple factors in the multivariate model, finding these kind of independent, um, independent factors purely associated with very, various um, uh, race and ethnic groups. Um, another study looking at this reduced social support was looking at after uh, hip, hip fractures and lower extremity joint replacement, finding that you're more likely to be discharged home alone um, with, with black and white uh, patients compared to Hispanic and Asian patients. And this related to the likelihood that, you know, Hispanic and Asian patients had lower likelihood of going to SNF than, than, than white and black patients. And maybe this is all a, a mine for unequal access to care. So when you think about this unequal access, um, there's, there's multiple different ways you think about it. I talked about insurance, I talked about geography, um, some of the socioeconomic or social, social characteristics might, might play a role, um, but there is some data behind this. So when you look at high volume institutions, and let's just for our second, and, and I can show you some data to support this, but there has been pretty good studies that show high volume institutions have better outcomes in general with surgery. And so in this, black race and female gender both were less likely to undergo cancer surgery, I'd argue a very important surgery, um, cancer surgery at high volume institutions than, than, um, than other races and then male genders. Um, similarly, in, in, uh, in our field, in orthopedics, that also played true. So black race, low socioeconomic status and Medicaid insurance were less likely to have their total hips or total knee arthroplasty done at high volume institutions. So you have this high volume institution where both our group, um, 
and many others have published improved outcomes. If you have your total hip, total knee, or we published on total shoulder arthroscopy being done at a high volume institution and you have better outcomes when it's done at that high volume institution. Well, there's not equal access to these high volume institutions. Um, another thing is, is patient preferences. And, and this is something that I think has had some nice and, 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 and nice study on it. And this is something that we are really investigating a lot more of. Um, so patient preferences, I think is, is a fascinating idea, fascinating concepts to think about. So this VA study, so universal insurance, everybody has access, everybody has the same access for the VA medical system. There is a disparity there. Thus, insurance is not, I would argue, and I'm trying not to inject my own bias, um, but I argue that this disparity is not because of insurance um, and, and potentially not even access. I mean, if you have this disparity the VA system, why would that exist? Well, I think this is where we kind of delve into this idea of patient preferences. So here's a study um, looking at um, patient preferences and, and total knee arthroplasty. Um, Blacks were, were, were less likely to um, undergo a uh, total knee arthroplasty than whites. And, and really, when you bear down, it was expectations of surgical outcomes and had to do with a lot of their willingness. You know, Justin Smalls, my, um, my surgical tech at, uh, at, uh, um, at EWASH and I were talking about this. And I was asking him, if you're going to decide to do a shoulder replacement, what would be some of the factors that would you be worried about? Whatever? He's like, for me, just be, uh, do I think I'm going to recover or not? And, and if I don't think I'm gonna recover very well, like I wouldn't wanna do it. And that's my biggest concern. And, and I, I think that bears a lot to this. Um, you know, their expectations of overall how they recover is their willingness to undergo surgery. Um, here's another study on total knee arthroplasty showing black patients were less willing to undergo total knee arthroplasty. And there's racial differences between the perception of benefit after total hip, total hip and total knee arthroplasty. And this really goes down to this idea of trust and confidence trust in the healthcare system, confidence in providers, confidence in the system as a whole, um, and confidence in that individual surgery and individual care team. Um, there actually has been evidence on trust. So when you look at patients, um, uh, when you actually look at how, how uh, the, the trust is a variable. So um, when you look at this, this determines in total knee arthroplasty, this, this, this study looked at those um, they're willing to do surgery. And really for, for black patients, it had to do with their trust in the healthcare system, their trust in providers. And so independently out of all the variables they looked at, trust in physicians and trust in healthcare were the two most important variables in willingness to why they would undergo it. And the disparities between uh, white patients, Hispanic patients, African-American patients, for black patients, it really was those that were, were had lacked, lacked trust in the healthcare system, lacked trust in providers. Um, here's another one looking at this idea of, of, of trust scores being directly correlated with utilization rates and knee replacements. Um, and, and these trust scores were both provider and healthcare system being, in, in this study, being um, willing to undergo research or randomized control trial participation rates directly related to, um, to the trust in the system, trust in the researcher, trust in the whole process. And mistrust is an important thing. It's not just they're not gonna participate in surgery or they're not gonna undergo surgery. When you have mistrust in the medical system as, as um, this really landmark kind of um, health services research project that was born out of some of the, the stuff that started in 2006, sort of showed us, those that were had higher rating scores of mistrust within the system as a whole were more likely to have missed appointments, were lower likely to ignore medical device, were more likely to postpone needed medical care, we're more likely to have a failure to fill the prescriptions and do a variety of things that, that honestly are, are critical for us to, uh, to, to, to care for a patient. So mistrust does affect outcomes and, and it is, is worth trying to address this. Um, patient confidence is another really important characteristic and you can imagine confidence in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, <clears throat> when you think about patient confidence, um, you can think about their confidence in, in the recovery. So as Justin talked to me about, how confident they are that they're actually gonna get better, how confident they are that they're, that they're gonna recover. And, and this study in, in, in Johnson County Osteoarthritis Project showed us um, looking at all the patients undergoing joint replacements, there was a lower post-operative expectation for black patients that they were gonna recover well. Another study, once again, <laughs> in joint replacement, lower extremity joint replacement showing there was a higher expectation of complications after surgery um, with, uh, with, with black patients. <clears throat> and so this kind of, <laughs> um, this kind of goes to then 
okay, so maybe we're starting to understand why these exist, but what can we do about it? And is there anything that's actually gonna make a difference? Um, and this is where I really want to just kind of sit back and kind of form your own opinion on not only why do you think it's there, but potentially what can we do about it? For me, some of these are some phenomenal, inspiring efforts that have been done. So Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that 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 uh, website, solvingdisparities.org, would, would encourage anybody interested in this going to that website. Um, it was founded back in 2004, I believe. Um, this really great roadmap. Um, they have this great algorithmic approach. They've funded a lot of good research on it. Um, and they're still continuing to fund this. Um, and then the NIH got involved through our... In, EMs and and uh, the AOS has even sort of got involved in the early 2000s looking at these efforts of of trying to actually make a difference um, and and you know creating these great partnerships like like this uh, the U.S. Department of Human Health Services has has focused on and investing resources into addressing some of these disparities you know the interesting thing is though that all started back in 2002 2003 2004 2005 as I showed you in some of the studies earlier, including our own, these disparities have not been adequately addressed. And if anything, at least in North Peaks are getting worse. This is the, uh, the, the kind of brain behind this, this amazing group of, of these four gentlemen that I'm showing you here. And um, you know, as you know, Alex, uh, Roy, and, and John have been working with us on a variety of research projects and really helping to kind of lead this. Um, Alex was the one who kind of introduced me to the idea of this group think mentality as we were talking about kind of why these were happening, what we could do about it. And then Lawrence is, is one of our visitors. Um, many of you know Sonia who left us for this awesome program called Nth Dimension. And um, through Nth Dimensions, they've teamed up with the ASES and um, we've been lucky enough to bring in uh, Lawrence from Howard and, and um, he is kind of helping to really get this off the ground. We're looking at a lot of these different factors and their association with patient experience um, and their decision to undergo surgery, their, their concerns about surgery, their confidence levels. And we're going to correlate these not only with them deciding about surgery, especially in the upper extremity, because there hasn't been really much research on this, but also correlating to how quickly they recover and, and sort of other factors. Because, I mean, these are you know, hopefully correlating to some real-time interventions that we can do. So one of the thoughts about what we can do is addressing conscious or unconscious bias. So, so Michelle Coleman um, did a phenomenal job when we, before we did our residency interviews, kind of introducing us to this idea. Um, we had a training process on those of you who've not done it. It's, it's, it's a fascinating training to be a part of and, and kind of really helps you kind of look, give some insight into, you, into your own perspective. But there is conscious and unconscious bias. And, and, and that has, there's a lot of factors at play into why you have that, that bias. Um, but physicians do have this bias. And, and this is a study looking at clinical vignettes. Um, so not actual patients, but clinical vignettes sent out to you know, hundreds of different physicians of all races, um, genders, age levels, experience levels. And black women were more likely to be, be, be perceived as having inadequate social support than, um, than the other um, race and gender groups. And you're talking about heart failure therapies. And so in a clinical vignette, this bore out that there was a true physician bias, regardless um, whether, whether people really think there is or not. This is another one looking at cabbage recommendations. So recommendations to undergoing a potentially life-saving procedure, black males were less likely to receive this recommendation to undergo surgery. So not even just less likely to undergo it, but less likely to receive this recommendation. And you take a variety of other factors and account for a lot of age and, and, and um, different uh, considerations around their heart disease. Communication, I think, is another important thing to think about and to consider. Um, and this is one of the things that we are looking into and we are um, currently asking about. So, you know, when you in, in this great, great study that uh, Dr. Cooper and, and Johnson sort of pioneered and uh, published early on, showing, you know, physician visits were with black patients when you when you reviewed them um, on a sort of blinded um, uh, uh, videotape were physicians were more likely to be verbally dominant and and were more likely to sorry were less likely to be patient centered. Um, furthermore, in, in in the side that looks at outcomes, black patients with uncontrolled blood pressure, so you're going into your, your your doctor because you have uncontrolled blood pressure or you're, you're having to recheck for your blood pressure. I would argue those that have under control blood pressure should be the ones that have the longest visits because those are the ones that you need to do the most counseling with. 
So black patients with uncontrolled blood pressure are actually the shortest visits in this study. Um, and the disparities in training, I think, is important. And I'm not going to go a lot into detail of this because this could be a whole other talk in itself. But uh, Scott Bowden has done a, a, a phenomenal job really in, in focusing on this and addressing this within our own training program. Um, Tom Bradbury as well, and Michelle Coleman has, has sort of helped to pick up that mantle. And, you know, programs like, like Lawrence's program, the information and programs like the one that um, <laughs> Michelle Coleman's leading this summer, these are, you know, really strong efforts to help this disparities in training. Um, and, and we need more leaders like, like these three in our field that's, that are trying to um, address these, these disparities. So, you know, this study um, very talked about, a very landmark study in WGS 19, 2009. So when you look at patients, the number of minority, sorry, not patients, the number of minority orthopedic surgery uh, residency applicants and residents, it's, it's decreased. From 2002 to 2016, despite the tension, despite the all the um, all the tension drawn in the media, drawn within our field, drawn by the AMA and the AOS, it's not impacting. You can see from from 2003 with a with a base down in 2010, 2011, but even through 2017, there is a a, a huge underrepresentation, and it has not been addressed. And if anything, it's gotten worse. When you look at the patients, not only program number of programs with this, <coughs> with greater than 200 represented minorities, compared to those with no underrepresented minorities, I mean, it's astounding that it actually got worse, um, and, and it still has not been sort of adequately addressed, at least at least uh, up in, up until recently. It'll be interesting to see if this kind of bears out in recent years. Um, this is a really provocative study that was done back in 2010, showing that it just it wasn't even just um, the number of residents, but it was the number of orthopedic applicants. So there were much more. There was a huge um, disparity in in number of of, of uh, Asian American, African American, and, and Hispanic patients applying to orthopedic residencies, and this was much more present than in many of these other fields like internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, general surgery. So orthopedics was the worst in, in, in when you're comparing across specialties. And then finally, sort of one of the other interventions, obviously, is, is education. This is, this is something that I think um, uh, is it, kind of a cool potential. I'm not going to impact my bias into this, but this is something that I'm working with those four gentlemen to, um, to eventually understand and, and potentially implement some interventions into this. And so... This is a cool study looking at a variety of different interventions. So they randomized a videotape, an education booklet, or a motivational interview by a hired um, clinical research coordinator and found that you were able to influence their willingness to undergo surgery in, in this uh, cohort of black patients with knee osteoarthritis from 65% to 80%. So almost on level with their, their, their white uh, cohorts. Um, and interesting enough, in this study, the videotape booklet and motivational interview all performed exactly the same, that each individual one was not better than the others. Another, um, another study looking at both a pamphlet and a videotape, there's no real difference between the two. They both though it helped to improve, improve people's willingness to undergo surgery, people's view about the outcomes after surgery. And this once again showed positive reinforcement plus education impacted people's perceptions of medical interventions compared to education alone. So once again, it's this idea of education and kind of positively reinforce the positives, not necessarily focus on the negatives that can really potentially have a profound impact in people's confidence in surgery and potentially their outcomes after surgery. And this goes to this idea of groupthink. So groupthink has positive and negative connotations. It's something that I've learned a lot more about since having the conversation with Alex. And it's something that I think does play a role in this. Um, and this is where I'm injecting my bias a little bit. So you have to, you have to uh, forgive me, but I do think that groupthink does it. So you know somebody who's undergone a total shoulder arthroplasty and they've done well, you're more likely to then undergo that, that shoulder arthroplasty, or be willing to or be excited about that shoulder arthroplasty than, than if you don't know anybody who's ever, if you've never even heard the procedure. Um, that you can apply that to almost anything else, like writing bungee jumping, um, you know, parachuting, anything you want. If you know somebody who's done it or you know people have done it, that stuff or really had a good experience with it, that's gonna make you more likely to do it. Um, here's, a, here's a study looking at um, in, in, black, in, in ob guy patients, um, that, that this is important, that black and ob guy patients were less likely to have heard of some of these really important genetic tests than their, their Hispanic, Asian, and white counterparts. Um, and, and another study looking at uh, how black uh, psychiatric patients were less likely to have heard of 
and as a result, be adherent to taking SSRIs than, than their white, Hispanic, or Asian counterparts. Um, and finally, this is kind of one of the things I think is really cool and really drives home the idea of the group think mentality. So in this, this study that was funded by our, uh, our, our um, Center for Minority Health in the, human, uh, in the Department of Human Health Resources, um, it showed that creating a peer mentor, so somebody that you is your peer that either has intimate knowledge about the procedure or had undergone the procedure and matching patients up with that, that peer mentor was more effective in, in controlling blood glucose in these African-American veterans than, um, than a financial incentive for them to have good, good blood glucose control or, um, or just kind of the usual, um, uh, the surgical team, or sorry, the, uh, the medicine team um, driving the care. So peer mentors were the most important factor in improving, not just convincing people to take medications, but actually improving glucose control in this randomized control trial. Once again, showing this value of like a group think mentality, knowing people that have had positive income outcomes. And this kind of shows, once again, the peer mentoring were more likely to have um, a, a positive change in, in HPO1C compared to those that were incentivized financially or, or those that just sort of visited their, uh, their cohorts in, um, or visited the, 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 uh, the regular medical team. So before I leave you, I kind of want to give some of my own future thoughts. Um, I told you I wouldn't inject too much bias into this. Um, I really want to kind of present data, let you make your own opinions on this stuff. Um, but for me, a lot of this is, is I think, very interesting. I, I do, uh, I am passionate about it. I do think it's um, something that is a, as we talk about in, in orthopedic surgery, non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. This is a modifiable thing. This is something that we can, we can absolutely modify, both with regards to utilization rates and what, as well as the result and the outcomes of those disparities in utilization rates. So the fact that there are discrete, concrete evidence to show differing utilization rates and different outcomes after surgeries or other medical interventions due to race or socioeconomic um, factors is something that we absolutely can look into and address. And, and I've kind of introduced you to a little bit of what we're doing. We are in the process of trying to evaluate this with um, all of our surgeries undergoing upper extremity in both um, my, the upper extremity service and, and, and elective upper extremity service. I know Mars is doing a lot of this and they're around the trauma population. Um, we are both not only trying to learn why patients decide the way they decide, we're trying to learn factors that influence their fears or their confidence levels and Given our, our phenomenal, robust patient board outcome measure system that uh, Mike Gottschalk has pioneered, um, we're going to look at how quickly they recover and, and, and how those factors influence how they recover. And then ultimately decide on what intervention, you know, and, and we're in the process of designing this intervention, but this intervention, can we actually, through interventions, change, change this? And before I leave you, I want to show you kind of a, lot, a big inspiration about this. Um, why I do think this is a modifiable risk factor and why this is something that's worth, worth uh, talking about, worth doing research on, and worth, worth uh, continuing to look into. So this study, looking at when the bundled payments, um, when bundled payments started to become popular, um, the state of Connecticut decided, <coughs> oh, sorry, um, this I, first before I talk about the, that state. So this study looked at how there's this, this one of our, one of the leaders, Marshall Chen, talked to us about um, uh, has talked to us about a lot of this stuff and really one of the leaders, thought leaders in this area really talked about how it is not sort of just a mindset of, of changing. This is a systemic, this is a, a cultural, this is a um, kind of uh, med healthcare field wide change that has happened. Um, policy reform, sustained funding for research and education, real meaningful changes are what's necessary, not just saying and you have an initiative and you know, you're going to do this initiative, but actually like getting real data, making real, real Troy changes, studying those changes and improving those changes. That's really how we're going to make this profound change. Um, and, and this is what I was getting at. So this um, study was, was done <coughs> looking at readmissions following uh, um, uh, total, total door plastic from 
2005 is eligible for me. It was done in Connecticut. It was done after around this time of bundle payments. And when the state, there was many statewide initiatives looking at, not necessarily from a, from a, a, a race or a social economic or certain test, but just as a global community health effort, how can we reduce these disparities and, and overall improve both outcomes and overall cost to a medical system by instituting changes purely regarding education, regarding um, access to information and access to access to care. And through this system, through the statewide initiatives that, that, were, that were adopted by hospitals all over the state, you can see the profound difference that they made. And they weren't targeting necessarily specific racial, racial groups. But you can see the profound differences that they have made um, where you had the gap right when this was being instituted in 2010, you can see the profound gap that you had in readmission rates. And you can see how much they were able to reduce this. And if anything, this shows you there is a way to change this. Um, there are interventions that we can do. Now, we can debate forever about what are those interventions, but, but, but it can be done. Um, it has been done. And I think it can continue to be done. I think at Emory would be cool given we are in Atlanta, a city with, you know, 55% of businesses in Atlanta are, are run by underrepresented minorities. When you look at our patient population, when you look at our um, community, we have one of the most diverse communities in the country, if not the world. Um, we are uniquely situated to be leaders in this. And even if this is not one of your main interests, the fact that you are living in Atlanta, the fact that you practice at the only academic center in Atlanta, it almost gives you a, a, a um, responsibility to be a part of this, to look into this, to look into it in your own patients, the only people you come and, and encounter and, and look at it, look at whatever those issues that I brought up, whatever you think underlie these utilization rate disparities, whatever you think that's underlying these, these, these access or these, these, these outcome disparities, by practicing Emory, it's almost your, your duty, I would argue, to, to at least uh, have these thoughts and, and potentially have this as a uh, consideration in, in your practice. So hopefully this, um, you know, I know, I know it's fairly long. Um, hope I give at least some time for questions. Uh, obviously, we'd love to engage many of you in these, this discussion. For those of you who don't like research, sorry. Uh, my mind is a very evidence-based, objective, research-minded person. Um, so I, I just naturally am going to respond better to objective stuff. And so that, that's also when I'm going to talk about a topic. I'm going to spend a lot more talking about some, at least some of the objective stuff, because I just think it's more meaningful, it's home better, um, and, it, and it's a little bit more concrete. Um, we, I, we are doing lots of these studies. I would love collaboration, collaborators in any of these aspects. You know, um, you know, Ed Jackson and I have talked about the sort of expanding this beyond our upper extremity department, but, um, but I mean, I think there's lots of cool stuff. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to uh, be leaders in this area. Um, I think we already are starting to be, but I think there's a lot of opportunities in the future for us to really be leaders in this in this field, especially given our location. So thank you. I guess I'd open up for questions. Definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. And I also want to thank you for your call to action there. I absolutely agree with you. We do have a unique and um, great opportunity to really be um, leaders in and making the change um, for uh, for just medical care in general across the nation. So we do have a few questions. Um, I encourage everyone, um, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, anything of that nature, please feel free to utilize the chat or the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. Um, our first question here, um, thanks for this talk, Dr. Wagner. What do you think clinicians should do once they've identified their own unconscious biases in order to overcome them? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the first step, right, is, is identifying that you have it. Um, and, and, and then identifying, um, you know, kind of doing some ill self introspection to why you have these biases and, and then what, um, what caused you to have them and, and how it is actually impacting, you know, how you see patients, how you care for patients. You know, um, I have my own biases as does everybody. It's a product of sort of our background. We grew up, I grew up in cities my whole life. I grew up in cities and, 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 you know, playing basketball and being involved in sort of a lot of these groups. And I will be honest, like, you know, I, I have an unconscious bias without question. When, when I treat a lot of rural patients versus city patients, I just have this unconscious bias because I just never knew that many rural patients, that lifestyle is just very different than what I'm used to. Like, and without question, there's a bias in, in how I 
view how they recover and, and come into the, the way they will kind of prioritize stuff. And it's just, it's something I've like realized more and more, especially being in a place like Emory that has a lot of rural patients coming in. I, you know, I had some college and that's not about race, but like that is a real bias that I know I have. I, I absolutely have. And I think you, you realize it. And then you consciously, when you were, when you realize you have a bias, you have to like consciously think about it. It can't be just something you identify and then all of a sudden done. It, it, you got to constantly think about it. And you got to like be self-aware. Think about like, if somebody is standing over your shoulder, somebody's let's say you're, they're filming a documentary on you know the life of of uh, Ed Jackson and 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 you know looking at everything that he's doing, you know just imagine like how you're acting in that documentary, how it would look in that documentary. I mean that's kind of that's what my uh, one of my mentors um, uh, and in basketball used to used to talk about all the time. But it was just like imagine if you were in a documentary, you know, would you do half the stuff or you say half the stuff or you do half the stuff with somebody that's filming you versus when you're not? If you're not, then why are you acting that way? Why are you doing that stuff? Especially in a professional environment. Um, it's honestly the same, the same principles here. And so I don't know. I mean, I think everybody, the first step is recognizing it. Second step is honestly consciously thinking about it, having conversations about it. And, and, and if I can be frank, like, um, you know, I, I do think that, uh, that, that, the having conversations, but not just not just having conversations, but proactively trying to correct your own biases and then studying it. I hate to say this and I hate to just focus on research, but for me, like that is the, the gold thing. It's one thing to talk about stuff, but it's another thing to actually like institute it and then see if it's actually effective. You, you are effectively changing your ways or see if you actually have these biases. I mean, it would be interesting to see some of those studies I showed you about unconscious bias. I wonder if that same thing would, would apply to us here at Emory. And, 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 and would it apply what, when, it, when it did apply, or would we have our own difference in biases? Or you know, are we different because of, where, because of where we are and who we serve? Like, do we have all this stuff? So that's, for me, the interesting stuff is let's understand it and then let's look at interventions to change it. So I don't know. I don't know the perfect answer, but I do think that they exist. Michelle Coleman did a beautiful job of introducing the whole faculty to this before our interviews last time. I hope we do it again before our interviews next time. I think it's a really nice thing to kind of revisit over and over again. Awesome, thank you. I um, I actually attended a um, DEI one day conference today and one of the speakers said, he did mention, you know, everyone has prejudice, prejudices and unconscious bias. And that first step really is to go to a mirror, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have prejudices, I have unconscious bias, but now that you've actually addressed it and recognize it, go from there on the, you know, what do you do? Because we all have them. Um, Absolutely do. And um, I, it's also our, our next fossil finds actually will be around unconscious bias. So that's a, a great segue into it. Um, we will actually have um, Dr. Gina Lumberg in July. She's going to do an interactive um, session with us on unconscious bias. So I encourage Perfect. everyone here to attend our July session. Um, it won't be a webinar um, platform because of the fact that it will be interactive. It will be kind of your traditional Zoom meeting um, so that we can do a few activities. So I encourage you all to attend. Um, looks like we are right at that 601 mark and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you all for um, for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Dr. Wagner, for today. Um, it was very educational. It was very interesting. I can't wait to get my hands on your presentation because there's some things that I want to look back on it. But um, thank you again. Um, and I hope that everyone has a beautiful evening and we'll see you again in July. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a, have a, good, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.